From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. We've been struggling a bit here at the New York Stock Exchange about how to appropriately recognize the 20th anniversary of 9-11 this Saturday. After all, the tragedy unfolded just a few blocks from here at the site of the World Trade Center and also at the Pentagon and in the skies over Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It's true the NYSE lost two members of its family at Windows in the World that day, Tom Sullivan and Bob Sutcliffe, and Their names are indelibly etched on a plaque on our trading floor. But while histories will recall those here at 11 Wall Street thought that they might be next around 9-11, and for that reason the streets around our building remain closed to vehicular traffic to this day, the real story for the NYSE came six days later, on September 17, 2001, when the exchange reopened after a historic four-day closing. You see, all of the key telephone lines that brought data and information in and out of the exchange passed through trunk lines that ran beneath the World Trade Center. And they were summarily buried beneath the hallowed tonnage of concrete, steel, glass, and human remains. The effort from that Tuesday of the attacks to the following Monday to reestablish connectivity for the market, and thus the very infrastructure of capitalism's economy was Herculean. It was deserving and certainly needed to see the governor of New York, the mayor of New York City, the state's two senators, and a crowd of first responders gather on our floor to ring the opening bell on September 17th and thus signal to the world that capitalism couldn't crumble as tragically as the two skyscrapers did. On that very day, Michael Gordon wrote the following lead in his story for the New York Times under the headline, After the Attacks, the Strategy, a New War and Its Scale. And Gordon wrote, and I'm going to quote here, When President Bush and his top aides talk about military action to end Afghanistan's support for terrorism, they are focusing on attacks to punish the Taliban and undermine their control of the country, not a full-scale American occupation. That's what... Gordon wrote, well, I guess the verdict of 20 years was a little different. As part of our two-episode series looking back at 9-11 and what lessons it has for us going forward, you may have already heard our conversation with Michael Arad, the architect of the 9-11 memorial and the meaning of that 10-acre parcel a few blocks away from here. And today we're going to expand the aperture considerably, casting our lens on the decade before the attacks and the two that followed with the man who knows and knows more about Osama bin Laden than perhaps any other American, my friend Peter Bergen, author of the new book, The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, out now from Simon & Schuster, our conversation with Peter on the attack, the perpetrator, the war, and now the aftermath is coming up right after this. In our time of greatest need, we want to thank the true heroes around the world for stepping up for taking care of us and keeping us safe. With your expertise, your commitment, your sacrifice, and your selflessness, we'll work together to create a brighter future. And we thank you for reminding us what really matters. From all of us, thank you. It was some time after Peter Bergen returned from producing the first television interview of Osama bin Laden in 1997 that I met him in Washington, D.C. in my final year working at the White House. And it was probably from him that I, like millions of others around the world, first heard bin Laden's name uttered. (laughs) I've been rereading Richard Clark's book, Against All Enemies, this week, and Both Peter's and Dick's books are reminders that few in government had heard bin Laden's name much before that. In the nearly quarter century since, Peter has written nine books, authored countless articles, and appeared 
a multiple of whatever that number is on CNN, helping to explain for all of us the threat of terrorism and the implications for national security. His books have been translated into 22 languages. He's the vice president for global studies and fellows at New America and a professor at Arizona State University, where he co-directs the Center for the Future of War. And now, at this suspicious moment, when we memorialize again the nearly 3,000 lives lost on 9-11 and the multiple of that lost and fractured by the 20 years of war that followed, Peter is out with what, when he pitched the rise and fall of Osama bin Laden to Simon & Schuster, might have felt like a coda on the global war on terror, but now may just be an intermission with another new unknown act yet to come. Peter, welcome inside the Ice House. Well, thank you, Josh. Thanks for having me on. The publication date for the rise and fall of Osama bin Laden was August 3rd, and you've been through the publicity tour process a dozen times, Peter. As a backdrop for your latest book, did August 2021 unfold as you expected it might? Uh, I mean, no. (laughs) President Biden has done a number of effective things, but his plan on Afghanistan was not one of them. And, you know, the the, the kind of criticism of it fall into two baskets. One is execution. Very few people can admire the execution except for the airlift right at the end. But then, you know, there's also just the border policy. And I I thought that, you know, it was possible that the Taliban might might do very well. I I didn't know that they were going to take over the entire country uh, so quickly. So unfortunately, on 9-11, we're going to have the split screen of uh, the names being read at the tr- uh, two blocks from uh, the, the Stock Exchange at the Trade Center Memorial, and potentially Joe President Biden being there because, uh, as you know, there's some opposition from quite a number of the families right now saying that um, unless they release more information about uh, the kind of Saudi aspect of 9-11, some, some families may boycott this. But... But leaving that aside, you know, the split screen will be that. And then, of course, you know, the Taliban celebrating their great victory, along with Al Qaeda and every other jihadist group uh, in Afghanistan will also be celebrating. So that that's going to be the split screen on 9-11, unfortunately. And that's not something that you know, anybody could have predicted. I mean, we've seen footage now of a vacant embassy in Kabul, a shuttered air base at Bagram, military materiel in various states of readiness left behind in Afghanistan. But beyond the government's property, there is a larger legacy in terms of institutions that followed U.S. forces into Kabul, like the American University in Afghanistan, where, as you've noted, thousands of students and graduates have been left behind. This isn't what everybody is chattering about, but it's a very real relic of our 20-year engagement. Tell us the story of that effort and what's left of it. Well, the American University in Afghanistan began 15 years ago. And of course, you know, the story begins with the American University in Washington, D.C., the American University in Beirut. Interestingly, President Ghani, uh, the former Afghan president, attended the American University in Beirut. So these and the American University in Cairo is well known. These, these universities have been centers of excellence. Uh, and one was founded in Afghanistan. Interestingly, Josh, it has the highest percentage of Fulbright scholars of any institution in the world, 11% of the students, which is an astonishing number that come Fulbright scholars. A lot of them now, of course, trapped in Afghanistan. And I, you mentioned Jimmy Carter. Obviously, this is very different from the hostage crisis in the sense that, you know, the, the Iranians were never going to release these hostages who really were being held in the embassy until until Reagan came into office. But there are, I mean, effectively, a lot of these students at the American University, they have a target on their backs, the Taliban attacked the university, killed more than a dozen people in 2016. They kidnapped two of the faculty, kept them for three years, an American and an Australian. And and these students are pretty well known in their communities. It's a big deal to have gone to this university. It's the best university in Afghanistan. And of the 4,000 alumni, students and staff, uh, only about 100 or 200 got out. So there's a lot of them that remain. And that's a microcosm of you know the larger situation, which the International Rescue Committee estimated that 300,000 Afghans had helped the United States in some shape or form. The the New York Times performed its own kind of analysis and came up with a 250,000 figure. So, yeah, the 120,000 plus that got out, that's great. Uh, Quite a number of them were Americans or other nationalities. I mean, before we look back at Osama bin Laden, Peter, looking to the future of Afghanistan, a young man 
who was 12 years old at the time of the 9-11 attacks, is 32 years old today. His name is Ahmad Massoud, the son of Ahmad Shah Massoud. I just want to play a little bit of footage that you produced in 1993, along with Richard McKenzie in Afghanistan, where a little boy clings closely to his father's leg. Let's listen. <laughs> What about this one here? The son? Your yeah, son, right. Oh, I see. Yes. Yes. Really cute kid. <laughs> this really cute kid, Peter, might be the future of Afghanistan. What does he have to say today? Well, you know, I'd forgotten about that footage, so thank you for reminding me. Um, so he's 32. He uh, went to Sandhurst, the British equivalent of West Point. He studied war studies at King's College, which is a great place to do an MA at. I communicated with him via email. He's in the Panjir Valley, leading the anti-Taliban resistance. He's got a very tough road to, to uh, it's going to be tough. I mean, his father was one of the great commanders of the 20th century, repelled nine so Soviet offenses, really contributed to the collapse of the Soviet effort in Afghanistan, was the main contributor. Also held off the Taliban, was assassinated by bin Laden's men two days before 9-11, sort of a curtain raiser for the 9-11 attacks. But so Akhmer, Masood is now leading the anti-Taliban resistance. He says he's trying to negotiate with the Taliban. It's really kind of fruitless, uh, which is not surprising. The United States negotiated with the Taliban, didn't get anything from them really of any significance, except that they got what they wanted and, and we left. So I think, you know, there's armed resistance is beginning. Uh, the difference is, you know, this reminds me, by the way, very much of, you know, on 9-11 on itself, I was going into CNN to talk about the assassination of Ahmed Shah Massoud by al-Qaeda. Here and the Taliban control of Afghanistan. Here we have Akbar Massoud again, the son, the Taliban in control again, 20 years later. None of this at all predictable. But they're gathering, you know, Tajik, uh, you know, the, the, the Taliban are basically a rural Pashtun movement from the south and the east. And they're trying to impose their values on Tajiks and Hazaras and Uzbeks and other ethnic groups and people who live in Kabul. Most of the Afghanistan doesn't particularly like these um, social customs. And some of them are going to resist. And the question is, you know, can they can they really take on the Taliban? The Taliban, I think, today is much stronger, unfortunately, than it was before 9-11, because just look at those pictures. Yeah. Andahar, where, you know, it reminded me of ISIS rolling into Iraq in the summer of 2014. It was, you know, they ISIS rolled in on these American military vehicles with the black flags flying. Well, the Taliban are rolling in on American military vehicles with their white flag flying. I mean, that's the, the visual difference only. So they've got all these American weapons. Uh, you know, they don't have the most sophisticated weapons, but you don't need that in a war where you're, you know, your, your opposition is pretty lightly armed. And the difference also is, is Ahmed Massoud, the son, doesn't have lines of communication to Uzbekistan or Tajikistan, which his father did. So it's hard to resupply money or arms or materiel. But one thing that might be useful for the agency, the CIA, is basically, you know, we're, we're now blind in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean we're completely blind because we have the National Security Agency. We can listen in on conversations, but our assets are gone. Uh, CIA officers are gone. So you do have a sort of lily pad here with this group in the Panjir Valley led by Abu Masood, who can give you some visibility into what's going on on the ground. Uh, so from an intelligence perspective, that, that may be useful. But militarily, um, you know, he faces a very steep hill to climb. That said, you know, the Taliban have a habit of, uh, it's not like they're the world's smartest people. They, they're going to alienate other ethnic groups. I'm pretty confident of that. They may engage in ethnic cleansing or killing of Westerners or allowing jihadi terrorist groups, which may just change the equation. And the United States or its allies may decide we're going to go back in. If you think back to 24 years ago, I want to just play another brief clip because the next voice we're going to hear is that of the legendary Peter Arnett. Amidst these remote mountains of Afghanistan are the various hiding places of one of the world's most wanted men. Osama bin Laden. We declared a jihad, a holy war, against the United States government because it is unjust, criminal and tyrannical. The U.S. State Department calls him one of the most significant financial sponsors of Islamic extremism in the world. 
You've recounted the story many times, Peter, but for our listeners, tell us one more time, how did you get that interview and what did it tell you as you made your way back to Washington? In February of 93, a group of men uh, tried to bring down the Trade Center. Uh, They drove a a van into the Trade Center uh, basement and blew it up and they killed six people at the end of February of 93. And so that, Peter Arnett and myself and a couple of others went to Afghanistan to try and kind of learn more about this group. In 96, we heard about bin Laden. I went to my bosses at CNN and said, can we go and interview this guy? Uh, they had never heard of bin Laden. It was not like it was a household name, but they kind of realized that we, in our minds then, we thought that maybe he was behind the first Trade Center attack. That wasn't quite right, but it turned out to be, you know, more or less right. And <clears throat> in the grand scheme of things, and he, so you know, I spent a lot of time with his people in his orbit in London, people who worked with him, people who were his colleagues, uh, they were kind of very suspicious. It was their first television interview. They didn't really understand how the Western media works. You know, they were they were kind of concerned we were agents of the CIA. They were concerned that we wouldn't give him a sort of fair hearing. You knew bin Laden better than anyone, but he was still very much, as you write, a sphinx without a riddle when Navy SEALs descended on his compound in Abbottabad in Pakistan on May 1st, 2011. What did the 470,000 files recover there reveal more about the sphinx? Well, you know, it's been Laden unplugged, and, um, you know, he didn't expect any of these. So the 470,000 files included a lot of stuff which was extraneous, like his kids were watching cartoons. He, um, of course, wasn't linked up to the Internet, so it, it, his bodyguards were giving newspapers on in, on thumb drives or bring PDFs of books to him on thumb drives. And so there was a lot of that kind of material. But there were 6,000 pages of useful material. Some of these memos, bin Laden would rewrite 50 times. So of the files, 6,000 pages of useful material. Mm-hmm. What do they say? They, they, well, they, they painted a portrait of bin Laden's relationship with his family uh, because some of these personal letters and, uh, and they also explained how he was trying to micromanage what remained of his organization. So the t- Trump administration released all these in full. One of the more, most interesting finds was a 228-page diary journal that the CIA described as bin Laden's journal. In fact, it was bin Laden's family journal, which is even more interesting because what in the last several weeks of his life, bin Laden was very concerned about the events of the Arab Spring, what he should say about them, because in his own mind, this was the most momentous event in the Middle East in centuries, yet he was not playing any role. And so every night, his two oldest wives with PhDs, who he kind of looked up to and who basically helped him write his speeches and do his thinking for him, they would have these like family meetings over before dinner and after dinner with his, also his two adult da- daughters taking notes, and they would discuss what Bin Laden should say about the Arab Spring. And they would also kind of chew over the events of the day because, you, you know, first of all, there was the revolution in Tunisia, and then the revolution in Egypt, and then the revolution in Libya, and then a revolution in Yemen where the Bin Laden family originates. And so they were very excited about these events, and they were kind of talking about it. They were kind of interviewing Bin Laden about his views, and then talking about this big speech that he was going to deliver. And Bin Laden's big idea was that he would Deliver, deliver a speech in which he would call for a council of religious scholars to advise the new governments. Now, of course, no one cared about what this idea, uh, but and of course, these scholars would all be Taliban-style scholars. But that was Bin Laden's big idea that he would, uh, you know, and, and he did actually record this video or audio, and it was released two weeks after his death by Al Qaeda. And he made, made some very planned statements about how excited he was to see these revolutions, and he called for this council of clerics to advise the new government. So your book is divided into three parts, Holy Warrior, War with the U.S., and On the Run, which was certainly informed by that cache of documents that was seized in Abbottabad. Let's slide back for a minute to part one. Tell me about the journey of Mohammed bin Laden and his brother Abdullah as they made their way from Wadi Doan in Yemen to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. It's a good time to be in the construction business given that Standard Oil which, after its breakup, now comprises parts of Chevron, ExxonMobil, BP, Marathon Petroleum, all New York Stock Exchange-listed companies. It was beginning for prospecting around 1930 at the same time Mohammed was showing up in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, he was. Uh, he had good timing. As you, so what he done, which is, I've actually visited, is it's in the Hadramaut in southern Yemen. Even today, it's sort of pretty much a medieval, you know, medieval buildings. Uh, women live in kind of, uh, you know, they're very much in living in Perda and they, it's very old school. But so in the 1930s, uh, there was nothing really to do there. And so anybody with any kind of uh, ambition left and they, some of them went to Egypt, some went to Malaysia, 
and some went to Saudi Arabia, which was just forming as the new Saudi kingdom in 1932. As you say, Standard Oil started, uh, I think, signed the first deal there, uh, maybe in 34, started prospecting, and suddenly there's this huge gusher of wealth. And um, Mohammed bin Laden, who was a bricklayer by trade, um, you know, kind of was very adept about inserting himself and essentially became the king's builder, uh, ingratiated himself with the Saudi royal family, became one of the richest men in the kingdom. On a business trip to Syria, he encountered a 16-year-old girl when he was 50. He already had multiple wives, who he'd married, some of whom he married and some of whom he divorced. He married the 16-year-old Alia Ghanem from Latika, which is on the coast of Syria. She's an Alawite, interestingly, which is a kind of heretical form of Shiism if you're an Orthodox Sunni. But Mohammed bin Laden didn't seem to mind. She was obviously very pretty and beautiful by everybody's description. And a year later, up, out comes Osama bin Laden. Within, by the time bin Laden's two, they divorce. And bin Laden is the only son of Mohammed bin Laden from this one wife. And at one point, bin Laden describes that her, his mother as a concubine, really not a real wife. He goes to summer school in the UK and he meets these Spanish girls and he kind of unburdens himself. And he's kind of a lonely guy and kind of a little withdrawn. And he says that, you know, he barely, he, he tells his own family that he barely knew his father, that he only had five meetings with his father only one of which was substantive. So, and then his father was killed in a plane crash age 10. Uh, that seems to have made a big impact on him, though he barely knew his father, and he became became religious after that point and became a kind of religious zealot, fasting twice a week, praying, you know, an extra set of prayers in the middle of the night. By the time he was 16 or 17, he was a full-fledged religious zealot and got married to a cousin from Syria. Uh, she was 15, he was 17, started having kids, started working in the family business, went to university, studied business administration, dropped out, joined the family business, and then the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And that really was kind of an inflection point that turned him towards, first of all, funding the Afghan resistance, resistance to the Soviets, and he personally fought rather bravely against the Soviets, out of which emerged Al-Qaeda. At his time at Oxford, those two and a half months studying English, he thinks the British people are morally degenerate and goes into this intense Islamic study and twice a week fasting, praying five times a day. Chart his course from here at age 14 to really age 31 and the Battle of Jaji against the Soviets in 87 when the idea of al-Qaeda is cemented in his head. Yeah, so he arrives in Afghanistan, he arrives in Pakistan at age 22, and he's got, he's bought cash within two weeks of the Soviet invasion. And, you know, he starts going back and forth from Pakistan with, you know, a lot of cash uh, helping the Afghan resistance. Of course, the main Afghan resistance is headquartered in Pakistan, and he's giving the money. And he doesn't go in until 1984 into Afghanistan because his family and people said it's very dangerous, which it was, by the way. The Soviets had total air superiority. They killed, you know, at least a million Afghans. It was extremely dangerous. In 1987, he decides to set up his own base in Afghanistan, which didn't make much sense because the Afghans were conducting a guerrilla warfare rather effectively against the Soviets. What They didn't set up fixed bases. But, you know, bin Laden had a different, and the people around him, they sort of wanted, they wanted to die. Uh, so that's not a very effective kind of military approach, generally speaking, sort of intentional death-seeking. Death but he set up this base quite near a Soviet base, Predictably, the Soviets came, including Soviet special forces. They attacked bin Laden. He lost 13 of his men. His, he, you know, he was rescued essentially by Afghans in the region. That he retreated, and the Afghans came in with 200 plus guys, and they sort of, you know, fought off the Soviets. So they called the base in Jaji in eastern Afghanistan. They called it the base, uh, which means Al Qaeda in Arabic, and, and the name kind of stuck. And in, by a year later, they had formal meetings in. Shower in, in Western Pakistan. And over the course of days of meetings, they founded Al Qaeda as we know it today, although at the time it wasn't really focused on the United States. It had a more general purpose, basically, to take the, the experience they had fighting the Soviets and fighting other jihads and against them. But then the socialist government in southern Yemen was the first. Uh, bin Laden wanted to you know, help the war against the Afghan communists who had replaced the Soviets. And so there were a whole series of jihads that he was interested in getting involved in, but he didn't really have any military experience in the Afghans. You know, one thing the Afghans don't need a lot of help with is fighting. And they always looked at him as sort of bin Laden, as sort of a money guy who didn't really know what he was doing militarily, which was very accurate. But, you know, the U.S., you know, when U.S. troops, including women, went, went into Saudi Arabia, this was another turning point for bin Laden. 
when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, he he was extremely angry about the 500,000 men and women of the U.S. military that came to Saudi Arabia in order to defend it. And uh, that is sort of latent anti-Americanism, yeah. and real hatred of the United States. When the battles of Afghanistan were behind him, bin Laden comes to the Sudan. Talk about the level, and you mentioned it there, about what he thought about his ability as a warfighter versus a money man. This level of self-regard that is emerging, the sense that he's the general of his own Mujahideen using the millions that he got from his brother's death to prop up the Sudanese government, embarking on this wave of entrepreneurial projects, eradicating the American infidels from Yemen and Somalia, the same ego that is going to be in tatters years later when he's holed up in Abbottabad. Yeah, I think, you know, that is one of the puzzles of the book. And I, I can't claim to have unpacked it completely. But like, you know, people, are, when he was in his early 20s, and he was in a meeting with others, he would say very little. He would uh, be almost monosyllabic. He was sort of in, he had a number of mentors, like Abdullah Razam, who was sort of this Palestinian cleric, who was very inspirational to a lot of the uh, Muslims around the world who came to try and get rid of the Soviets in Afghanistan. By the time he, you know, sets up Al Qaeda, he's 31. He, and then he moves to Sudan. He's suddenly one of the biggest businessmen in Sudan. After all, Sudan's an economic basket case, and it was run by an Islamist government. No, no, no sane investor was going to put any money in. And bin Laden, by his own account, put $29 million in, was kind of really a big deal. And he was rebuilding the main road between um, Khartoum and Port Sudan. He was he set up a tannery, a bakery. He had a million-acre farm which is, with uh, 4,000 laborers. He was a big deal. And so at least publicly, that was a, he did his first interview with the Western press, and he presented himself as a businessman to Robert Fisk of The Independent and also to Scott McCloud of Time magazine. Meanwhile, he was also secretly planning to attack American troops in Somalia. He sent people to Somalia to train Somalis. They, they certainly did train Somalis, and it's quite possible the Black Hawk Down incident involved al-Qaeda uh, trained Somalis who you know, brought down those American helicopters. But all that was not known in the U.S. government, really. They, they understood that bin Laden was a problem. One of the kind of main characters in the book is Gina Bennett, who was a female, a young junior analyst at the State Department who began noticing these Afghan Arabs, as they were called, around bin Laden, were poppy, popping up in Bosnia and Algeria and joining armed groups. And she wrote the first sort of official, highly classified memo about bin Laden in 93. So that's when he really came on the radar of the U.S. government. And in 96, they released, uh, the State Department released a, a public paper just identifying him as a financier of Islamic extremism. So, but even then, you know, only a relatively small group of people in the U.S. government really were focused on him. You mentioned Richard Clark. He was, of course, one of them. And there were people at the CIA and the people at, at the New York field office of the FBI, which is also not far from where, you know, the New York Stock Exchange. One of the other, by the way, interesting characters in the book is Mary Galligan who took over the 9-11 investigation, she um, she eventually became the special agent in charge of the New York field office of the FBI, which, of course, is the most important uh, office of the FBI in, in, the, in the nation. But she ran the 9-11 investigation. They couldn't, when the Trade Center collapsed, they couldn't use the FBI field office just around the corner from the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, this whole period, Peter, in 1996, I think is perhaps for me the most fascinating part of the timeline. I mean, he's jetting back to Afghanistan. He's thrilled to be back in the mountains of Tora Bora in this mud house that he makes for his family. Basically, you describe it as having his own little feudal kingdom that he could look out on. And meanwhile, you know, so many thousands of miles away in the summer of 96, I'm planning Bill Clinton's famous train trip to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Take us into the Situation Room, because you allude to it. Richard Clark writes a lot about it. People like Tony Lake, Sandy Berger, Clark, John O'Neill, they are wrestling with these institutions like CIA and FBI that really are, are trying to get their arms around what this might represent, but they're really not tooled up to do it. The CIA set up Alex Station, which was devoted up, uh, to you know the, the bin Laden subject, and they were – it was – run by Mike Schroyer, who had wanted, you know, said bin Laden's going to kill thousands of Americans. And there was, there were a number of times that bin Laden, you know, we didn't have armed drones at the time. Of the, uh, so, you know, basically it was cruise missiles initially, and then it was surveillance drones uh, and using Afghan tribal uh, assets on the ground. So the embassy attacks kind of changed the, the whole view of this. And, you know, one, one actually useful resource that I was able to draw on 
the University of Virginia has the Miller Center, uh, which is you know, there's very useful oral histories of a lot of the key players in the Clinton administration. Yep. And so yeah, there, there was no debate after the embassy attacks in Africa killed 12 Americans and 200 Kenyans and Tanzanians. So this guy was a real problem. But the question was what to do about it. And if you don't have, you know, cruise missiles take six hours to get to their targets. By the time you identify the target, check with the White House, send the order to the um, to U.S. naval ships in the Arabian Sea, and they and then they have to fly hundreds of miles. So you, you didn't. It wasn't good enough to know where Bin Laden was right now. You had to know where he might be in six hours. So that that's kind of hard intelligence to come by. And then you. You, you know, Mike, Dick Clark was really pushing along with Michael Sheehan, who became head of NYPD, counterintelligence, counterterrorism, unfortunately, it died relatively recently. Sorry, they, they were really pushing the Pentagon and the CIA to develop an armed drone because they knew that would be a, a game changer. And what did happen is that the surveillance drones began to get imagery of bin Laden in real time. So that actually, you know, helped the picture. But then, of course, 9-11 happened. And, you know, then any debates about who would pay for the armed drone because there were debates hard to recall between the Pentagon and the CIA at the time about what happens if a drone crashes or whatever and who would pay for it. All that went out the window and the first armed drone flight, uh, successful armed drone flight, you know, took place in, in months after 9-11. Well, we're not quite there yet in our timeline, Peter. The question as you set it up is what to do about it, given what U.S. military and government agencies have at their disposal in the very last final years of the 1990s. After the break, Peter Bergen, author of The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, and I talk about 9-11, the aftermath, the death of the wanted man, and what it all means 20 years on. That's all coming up right after this. We started with a vision to transform energy markets, using technology to boost transparency and level the playing field. That vision and customer focus continues to drive how we look at opportunities and challenges in our industry. Today, we connect participants around the world so they can trade, hedge, invest, and raise capital. We establish prices across asset classes and create opportunity to solve complex global problems. We provide pricing that markets rely on, transform the way business is done, help companies grow to fuel innovation, and provide data to advance economies and society while we invest in our communities. 20 years ago, we saw an opportunity to create a market driven by customer needs. Today, our markets create endless opportunity for participants around the world, and our team is focused more than ever before to ensure the markets continue to function properly. On behalf of my colleagues around the globe, thank you from Intercontinental Exchange. Welcome back. Before the break, Peter Bergen, author of The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden and I, we're talking about the conspicuous rise of the al-Qaeda leader and Peter's encounter with the man on the plateau in the hills of Tora Bora, Afghanistan. The interview aired on May 10th, 1997, probably not long before I met Peter in Washington, D.C., Peter, talk to us about al-Qaeda at that point as a business. It's tempting to dismiss it as radicals firing off their AK-47s in the desert, but we're really talking about an MBA-level organization. Yeah, I mean, they try to organize themselves along business lines. And I, you know, Bin Laden studied business administration at university, he went to a very good university in Saudi Arabia. He dropped out to work full-time in his family business. Obviously, his father was a great businessman who built up one of the biggest construction companies in the world. And so I think he brought some of that to play when he set up his organization. And, and the evidence for that is some of the documents that have been recovered in, in uh, Afghanistan on the battlefield. So, for instance, you know, al-Qaeda's bylaws, I think, ran to 36 pages. Mm -hmm. And they do things like, you know, kind of what your furniture allowance was. Uh, if you were married in Al-Qaeda, the loans they would give you for buying furniture, the, those loans, I think you had to repay if you left the country. So very bureaucratic, if you, you know, how much money you get paid, if you have, depending on how many wives you had, how many kids you had. The vacation policy, a pretty generous one. So let's talk about tracking the path of the 9-11 plot itself from, I guess, the issuance of the fatwa in Al-Quds al-Arabi in 1998 to the PDB 
given to President Bush on August 6th while he was on vacation in Crawford, Texas. You note that some of the credit given by writers like Lawrence Wright to Zawahiri was misplaced and that it really took the U.S. some time to wise up to the real threat, which got some momentum when Michael Shearer was appointed to lead Alex Station. When I wrote my first book, I thought Eamon Al-Jawari was a key player in all this. But I, now that I've you know, looked at all the documents and talk, you know, seen a lot, of, a lot of memoirs of people who know both of them have come out or people, there's, there's so much more information now we, we now know. You, you mentioned the Sphinx without a riddle. I mean, the riddle, you know, there's so much we now know that we didn't know. And I think there was an overestimation of Eamon Al-Jawari. Lawrence Wright and myself were both part, part of that over, overestimation. And it, and it was a kind of, uh, it wasn't surprising because in the videos after 9-11, Bin Laden, Zawahiri was always by Bin Laden's side. But in fact, you know, the big idea of attacking the United States came from Bin Laden himself. And uh, Zawahiri had no role in the, the planning for 9-11 or any of the other major anti-American attacks. And, you know, Zawahiri is an Egyptian. He was really focused on trying to overthrow the Egyptian regime, a subject that Bin Laden could care less about. And Bin Laden really wanted to attack the United States in order to you know, in his own view, that would lead to the fall of the Saudi royal family. And his, you know, the two things he was preoccupied about were the Saudi royal family and the U.S. and the U.S. kind of influence on it. And so, these were all Bin Laden's ideas. There's no evidence that Zawahiri played a big role in any of this. And now, of course, he's a leader of Al Qaeda, and he's not been a very effective leader, and he may not be doing very well. We haven't seen any or heard from him for quite some period of time. You play an interesting role in that key moment in August of 2001, Peter, after analyzing this video of bin Laden and sharing your thoughts with John Burns of the New York Times. The story doesn't run that Burns writes until after the attacks on the World Trade Center. Was the so-called editing dispute that you note, what was that? And, and how might history have been any different had the story run? Well, you know, this is a really interesting story that I didn't completely unpack in, in this new book because I've unpacked it elsewhere. But so I wrote, I, I found this two and a half hour videotape. You know, Al Qaeda and the groups like it, they're all early adopters or whatever the current technology is because they're all a bunch of guys in their 20s, a lot of them, and, and they're middle class. And, and so they put out this tape that was in sort of uh, in these sort of secret chat rooms, password protected. And on the tape, Bin Laden, I thought, made a lot of threats of the kind that indicated another attack was coming. I wrote John Burns of the New York Times, then the main foreign po- foreign correspondent, you know, a four-page letter saying, hey, this is what I think is, you know, here's why I'm concerned. And so I didn't have access to classified information, though, obviously, just what was out there publicly. He wrote a piece on videotape bin Laden charts, A Violent Future was the name of the piece. They ran it on their website on Saturday, two days before 9-11. They didn't put it in the newspaper because of an editing dispute. And then they didn't put it in the newspaper until after 9-11. Instead of being page one, it was on page 26 because the thing had already happened. And they've admitted this was a mistake later. They then took down the, the piece that was on the website from the Saturday. Um, and I'm not, yeah, why they did that. Maybe they were embarrassed that they hadn't put it in the paper, but they did. They took it, they took it down. Anyway, the, the reason I included that anecdote in the book at all was it, you didn't need access to classified information in the summer of 2001 to say, hey, something is up. And if you had access to classified information, as the CIA did, I mean, they, the CIA did a very good job on strategic warning to the Bush administration. The Bush administration just didn't absorb it. I mean, in the aftermath of 9-11, as we go on through the book in the manhunt, Peter, you've got General Jim Mattis and his thousand Marines advancing on Tora Bora and the 10th Mountain Division stationed in Uzbekistan ready to go in. But General Tommy Franks is relying on Afghan warlords to mix it up on the ground while American bombers drop a daisy cutter on bin Laden's compound. How close did Americans come actually to getting him in those early years? They came very close to Tora Bora. I mean, they dropped 700,000 pounds of ordnance on Tora Bora. And bin Laden, you know, narrowly avoided being killed. He, in fact, I think he was wounded in the shoulder after the Battle of Tora Bora. We say, I say that because he released a videotape. He looked ashen and gray. He couldn't move his left uh, side. Um, and uh, he wrote his will at the Battle of Tora Bora. In his will, he advised his children not to join Al Qaeda. So he, you know, that's the frame of mind he was in. You mentioned the Jim Mattis book. That, this brings me back to a point that you know, one of the it's it's so great that when you when you write a book like this, more and more information comes out that you wish you'd known earlier. Because I always was puzzled by, you know, Jim Mattis had at least a thousand Marines on the ground near Kandahar. And, you know, a more gung-ho commander commanding a more gung-ho group of people, it would be hard to find. 
and I, I knew that there'd been some communication between Mattis and others about what to do about bin Laden being at Tora Bora. But in his new book, Jim Mattis says that he had a really fairly well-developed plan to send in a, a large group of Marines into the Tora Bora area, which is quite far from Kandahar, several hundred miles at least. And they would set up observation posts. They would, um, you know, they would kind of cut, cut off lines of retreat. And that, you know, he presented that plan to the Pentagon and it just sort of died on arrival. Uh, but it, so it always been a bit of a mystery to me about why, about you know, what Jim Mattis, what, what what these Marines could have done, and obviously Tommy Franks, who was then the, the ground commander, he was very opposed to kind of sending any additional American troops into Tora Bora. For some reason, he thought it would replicate the Soviet defeat in Afghanistan. Now sending in several hundred, you know, um, Marines or Rangers into Tora Bora for the limited purpose of getting the lab was not replicating the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. It never happened, um, and it's one of history's great odds. What ifs? It, you know, the fact is that Tora Bora is up to 14,000 feet. I've, I've been there for on a number of occasions. You know, even if you sent in a bunch, you know, a, a battalion of rangers or whatever, you know, it would still have not been that easy because you landing helicopters there would be very hard. It was the middle of winter. It's a mountainous region. There's lots of ways to escape. But that said, the Ameri United States, you know, I went back to check this fact. The Trade Center was still, the pile at the World Trade Center was literally still smoldering on December 12, 2001, when bin Laden escaped from Tora Bora. And it's the same day that bin Laden, sorry, that, that Donald Rumsfeld is getting briefed on the Iraq war plan by mm. Tommy Franks. Literally the same day that bin Laden escapes. And literally, the, the Trade Center is still smoldering. So, you know, that, I think, says a lot about where their head was at and, and kind of a missed opportunity. There's no doubt. Senator Kerry, as you may recall, in the 2004 election, tried to make this uh, really an election kind of issue. Uh, he was right. Um, and, uh, you know, bin Laden suddenly reappeared during that election. Four days before that election, bin Laden appeared in a videotape that he would have recorded in Pakistan. He's behind a desk. He's presenting himself as sort of like the old statesman of jihad. He's dressed in a gold gown. He's talking about the election. And you know, Karl Rove had a really interesting response to that because on one level, this would have seemed problematic. Bush had really let him go at the Battle of Tora Bora, or, or not let him go, but you know, hadn't made you know, hadn't made a real effort to get him at the Battle of Tora Bora. Bush still polled better on terrorism than Kerry, even despite that. And Karl Rove said, well, I don't think this has a sort of feel of something that won't hurt us. And of course, that was, a, as you recall, Josh, it was a close election. Yeah. In 2004, this is all very fresh in people's minds. So, Peter, 10 long years after Mattis and the Battle of Tora Bora, here is President Obama in the East Room at the White House, May 1st, 2011. Good evening. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of al-Qaeda and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. Peter, over the decade, we've read so many accounts of the raid and are going to revisit a lot of them this week as we come up to the 20th anniversary of 9-11. But based on what you've been able to reconstruct before we get to the raid itself, given all of your perspective over the decades, what had become of the person known as the pacer in the Abbottabad compound at that point as he was being surveilled? You know, he had a lot of time on his hands. He was sending these very lengthy memos to his organization. He was, it was like running a business in the early 19th century. In the sense there was no phone, no telegraph, no internet. He was, you know, essentially communicating through hand-delivered messages. Sometimes they might get lost. Sometimes people might just ignore them. Sometimes they would month, it would take months for these messages to go back and forth. But that's the way he was maintaining control of his organization. He was attempting to micromanage it. He was mixing Anwar al Laki, who was a, a Yemeni-American prominent in al-Qaeda in Yemen, was proffered as a leader of the group, and bin Laden sort of said, I don't know this guy, and nixed that appointment. Uh, bin Laden told al-Shabaab in Somalia, which is an al-Qaeda affiliate at the time, effectively to sort of not mention that it was a really part of al-Qaeda because it would be bad for fundraising. They followed that advice. He had initially two of his wives and 12 of his kids and his grandkids around him. So that was kind of, you know, he had a sort of domestic setup. He was kind of trapped. He was sort of, a, it was a prison in which he was also the, the warden, the chief warden. 
I went on the compound, the only outside observer to be allowed in by the Pakistani military that controlled it, you know, two weeks before it was demolished. I, I went with my wife and we, we, we lobbied to get on and we, you know, we knew that pa my wife had spent time with the Pakistani military for a documentary with National Geographic. And so we were you know, pretty well connected with them. And we, I said, I'd come back for the third time. I said, look, please don't waste my time. You know, for on the third trip to Pakistan, you, you know, if we, I, you've said before I can get in. So they, we, we had um, some ISI, which is the Pakistani military intelligence service controlled the compact. Um, and they, of course, have probably the most powerful force in Pakistan. So they, I think they must have known that the compound was going to be demolished. They didn't tell me that, but I think they, for, for their own reasons, wanted some independent observer to, to get in to see what 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 was there. And so I got in, and uh, it allowed me to get a better sense of what happened that night, the night of the raid. You could see the evidence of a very you know violent operation that took place that night. You could. I also got a better sense of how Bin Laden was living. Um, you know, getting back to your original question, each of his wives had her, her own little apartment with a very crude sort of kitchen. And that was similar to how he lived in Sudan and then also in southern Afghanistan. Each of his wives had her own apartment, her own kitchen. The deadliest terrorist attack on the New York before 9-11 happened just across the street from where I'm sitting, Peter, when anarchists bombed the J.P. Morgan headquarters, killing 30 people. That didn't stop Wall Street from becoming what it is today. You write at the end, you mentioned her at the beginning of our conversation, Gina Bennett, asking a young CIA analyst if they knew what the Bader meinhof gang was. In 40 years, will a future CIA analyst know what al-Qaeda was? Well, I mean, the Bader meinhof gang obviously didn't kill 3,000 uh, American civilians in the course of the morning. So, But I, I think you know what Gina Bennett was trying to say to this young CIA analyst is, over time, bin Laden will become less important. And I think that's true. His ideas are, are, are fading. Obviously, you know, the Taliban have a form of his ideas um, and are back in power, which is sort of was not predictable several months ago. You know, over time, I think bin Laden will become less and less relevant. Most Muslims uh, don't approve suicide attacks uh, because they've been so devastating in countries like Iraq and Pakistan. Afghanistan. His ideas kind of li linger on on the internet. Uh, he isn't going to go away entirely. Religious terrorism. You know, the, the thing about religious terrorism is you believe that God is on your side. You can't really abolish God. You could you could abolish the Soviet Union, and that really kind of killed most Marxist terrorist groups around the world. Uh, but you can't abolish God. It's a different matter. So these ideas, I think, are going to be hard to completely destroy, uh, or, 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 or they will fade away perhaps over time. But, you know, Bin Laden is one of the few people, one of the reasons I wrote the book is Bin Laden is one of the few people who can really say changed history. Um, you know, you can't explain why the French were at the gates of Moscow in 1812 without Napoleon. You can't explain the Holocaust without Hitler, in my view. Now, of course, Napoleon had a, and Hitler had a far bigger influence on history than Bin Laden. But he certainly set the course of foreign policy of the United States and much of the Muslim world for the first two decades of the 21st century. And that's no small feat. And he changed America in ways that are unexpected, I think. You can't draw a direct line from from uh, Osama bin Laden to, to Donald Trump, but I think you can say the following. You know, Trump, when he campaigned, it was at the time that ISIS had killed all these people in Orlando and San Bernardino, and Americans were very concerned about terrorism as an issue. And when he came up with the Muslim travel ban, which is a practical matter, would have had no effect on the issue of terrorism since Omar Mateen, who carried out the Orlando attack, was born in Queens, where Donald Trump was born. The Muslim travel ban was appealing to most of the vast majority of Republican voters and half of Americans. And it was a very simple idea. But in the, in, if 9-11 hadn't happened, it would be a non-issue because terrorism would not have been, you know, people were concerned about terrorism because of 9-11 is always in the background. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying there's a straight line from 9-11 to Donald Trump. But I am saying that there's a dotted line. Certainly this Muslim travel ban would not have been the idea that that would have had any political valence in the absence of 9-11, which was one of the hinge events of American history. I'm sure, Peter, you've wrestled with questions like this before. But now, you know, 24 years after your first interview with bin Laden, 20 years after 9-11, 10 years after his death, Peter Bergen has been and really continues to be Osama bin Laden's explainer to so many of us. People should have paid more attention to that when that Peter Arnett special aired back in 1997. But given the lengths that Dick Clark had to go through in his chicken little days, I, I guess my question is, after all of this, does bin Laden need, does he deserve to have an explainer in 2021? 
Yeah, part of it, you know, I'm teaching kids at Arizona State who weren't born on 9-11. And one of the brightest students in the class asked me, what's the difference between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban? And I was like, well, that's a very interesting question. Um, there's a lot to kind of explain there. You know, as people joining the U.S. military today, the people, some of the Marines who were killed at the Kabul airport were either, you know, not born on 9-11 or, or were just, you know, were literally babies. And so for, for me, the Korean War is something that happened in history. And for so many young people today, uh, 9-11 is an, an event not in memory, but in history. And uh, I thought this was kind of a, a, a good moment to try and explain who he was and what he did. That was part of the motivation for this. Before we get to the index and acknowledgments in the rise and fall of Osama bin Laden, Peter, the hardcover version of the book clocks in at 363 pages, 114 of which are devoted to sources and notes. And your final words are addressed to your son, Pierre, in which you write, now it's done, finally. Are you done with bin Laden? And are those 114 pages of notes a roadmap to some future Peter Bergen who wants to take up the mission that you've been on for a quarter century? Uh, I'm definitely done with the bin Laden subject. I mean, 100 percent. But you know, my wife and I met in Afghanistan. She's from Louisiana. And we are talking about writing a book about basically what just happened in Afghanistan. We have a lot of Afghan friends and We've been reporting from there for a long time, and you know, um, we, that's unfortunately, you know, th there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen of this particular debacle, and trying to unpack that, and also trying to remind people that there were a lot of good things that went right in Afghanistan. Where everybody knows all the things that went wrong, but going back to the American uh, University of Afghanistan, which we talked about at the beginning, you know, all those kids, the Fulbright scholars, and the women who got an education, and uh, the future, that this is a very young country, to, I think 75% of the population is under the age of 25, a very vibrant independent media, hundreds of TV stations and radio stations, all that is unfortunately about to be in the process of being destroyed. So trying to understand how that happened and the lessons that we can try and draw, uh, that's really our next project. Many stories continue to need to be written, Peter. Thank you for joining us inside the Ice House and thank you for the truth and facts that you've shared with all of us for the last 25 years. Uh, well, thank you, Josh, and thank you for having me on. And that's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Peter Bergen, author of The Rise and Fall of Osama Bin Laden, out now from Simon & Schuster. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouseatice.com or tweet at us, at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Stefan Capriel with production assistance from Pete Ash and Ian Wolf and Stephen Romanchik. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 